living in Kansas a few years ago, and the Kansas Department of Ag person said to me, you know, the problem is all we look at in Kansas is job creation. That's not necessarily the best thing that farmers markets do. I mean, you know, I mean, it's really an interesting question. What we're talking about often is farmers adding family members and, to their, and they're not necessarily paying them on, a, on the same way. So maybe there's other ways we can think about that. Like, for example, that. You're talking about a farmer who now has two or three kids who are managing parts of that business. I think of a dairy farmer we have in Louisiana who I remember when, a young, young couple, and, uh, I mean, you know, me young, and they had, they told me that their, she was maybe 19, 20, maybe not even that old, maybe there, she was 18, their, their older daughter was going to be the president of the creamery. She had, they just made her the president of the creamery. And I remember thinking, that is so cool, you know? And she's like, well, I'm the president. And, you know, she had no idea what that meant back there. But, but they wanted and they kept their family in that business. And that means the family's not moving away, right? The kids aren't moving away and the grandkids are growing up there. Or it could mean, I, I think of farmers who will work with uh, uh, migrant workers. I think of farmers I know who are working with migrant workers and then move them into a situation where they're working on their own land. You know, I think of an heirloom strawberry farmer that I know in Louisiana whose family just bought land after working, living in a trailer on another farmer's property for a number of years. And he taught her all of his Italian heirloom variety, you know, growing techniques, and she's adopted them and added some other things to it. And now they're neighbors and both farmers. And that's been an evolution that took a long time. But again, it's the economic piece that we have to capture. I mean, there's, I think we could be pretty creative here. I think what we have to do is make sure that we're, we're disciplined about how we collect the data and that it compares well. One of the things about this seed report, so what it does, seed, instead of asking farmers what they do and ask shoppers how much they're gonna spend that day, and then it puts data into an online tool which then shows a multiplier effect in the community. Because the reason why we did this is when we created it well over 10 years ago, we were actually concerned about the impact of city, the city government on the markets in our area. The city government was saying to us, yeah, yeah, I get it, this is really nice, but um, those farmers that you're talking about live in other, in, in our area of parishes or your county, counties, they don't live here. So they make that money and then they take it back to their counties. How is that helping me? And my, how am I going to argue that to the business right next door to you? And so we created this tool partly to show that, of course, those shoppers, as we know now, stay, stay downtown, come downtown because the markets spend money nearby, pay taxes, and so on and so on and so on. Let's find those linkages so that we're not leaving somebody out of this. We're not just assuming that an audience believes a word of the fulcrum of their, you know, their rebirth, their economy. We have to prove it. So I think, again, the big, but the big picture is what's the goal? It's not just to show we've made this money, this money's changed hands. It's, it's, it's keeping wealth in the region. It's we're showing how we're doing that in so many ways. And, and every community is going through this economic recovery, we hope. And so we know we have to think about that. You know, our governments are shutting down services all of the time. They're not able, they're not enough money to cover it. They're certainly thinking about every piece of that. And we can figure out a way to say, look, this is long-term recovery. This is how we're going to rebuild. We're going to keep people in this. We're going to keep regional farmland, so on. So economic indicators are really necessary. Social capital to me is the big one, though, I'll say. Economic, I think we share that with lots of other sectors, and that's important to know what that is. Um, but all of this is, is kind of hinged on the idea of social capital, and the, the, really the truth is what that stands for is trust. Trust is what we're talking about. When you uh, have a, a group of farmers selling food in the sun in a parking lot on a hot day and people buy it, there's trust, right? When your city says to you, you know what, this is a great idea, we're gonna give you the space for free, that's trust. 
When a vendor calls you and says, you know, uh, you say to them, I'm going to open a new market during the week, and they say, all right, I'll give, you, I'll give that a shot. That's trust. Farmer lets another farmer watch their table. That's trust. Shopper asks to write a check. Farmer accepts the check without any backup. That's trust. So many, many, many ways. And when you look at it, just when you, when you study social cohesion and social capital, uh, you find that there are a lot of ways that this actually plays out in your community, how important this is. And so, of course, in the public health community, what we've learned about is what we call the social determinants of health. This was such a great thing when the public health, you know, very kindly explained that to us farmers market people and said, well, yes, you're, here's what you're doing. You're creating a whole place where people can actually um, make, change, their, change their, make their decisions uh, based on the better trust they have with you. The way that we measure this is a little complicated. It's hard. You can think about the things I just said. Some of those indicators I just said are some of the ways. We did everything from watching uh, the quality and quantity of transactions, verbal and, and physical and non-economic. Non, uh, uh, you know, non Again, watching how different things are happening, how many volunteers you have in. There's all kinds of ways, but social capital is actually the core of what we're talking about here. Because that's how we, we are the full form, is because we remain the democratic <coughs> town square where all these players come together and they can have these exchanges, which we're not really managing all the time. So that's extremely important that we think about social capital in our, in our food systems and we think about how we're increasing that. Civic engagement, there's all kinds of terms for this. But you have to think about how your market, because the truth is in every one of these situations, uh, the market has to be the player. It has to actually engineer this. The thing about markets is that they're an incredibly efficient mechanism, but it's engineered. It doesn't just happen. We make it happen. And so in order to really understand that and make it more happen more, you need to make sure you're measuring it. So social capital, but the key, bridging and bonding. So this is interesting. Bridging and bonding. I, I'm sure there are people in the room that are much more knowledgeable about this stuff than I do, but I read a lot about it as a market, a person obsessed with farmers markets, and, and about creating these indicators. And uh, I remember uh, one of the you know uh, scientists saying to me, well, you know, markets, they, they, they're really good, um, you know, there's bonding and there's bridging, and, and uh, you know, bonding happens between people of, um, you know, that have deep ties to each other. And then, you know, there's, then there's, there's strong ties and then weak ties. And I remember somebody saying, well, you know, markets have weak ties. And I was like, oh, they do not. They have strong ties. Very upset by that language. And I remember finally somebody saying, well, you know, the point is for when you look at weak ties and strong ties, so again, strong ties are people who are connected in much deeper ways through clubs, through family, um, certainly markets that then build strong ties. Uh, people get, uh, they, they get advice from their strong ties. But for weak ties, interestingly, they get new information. That's the main place to get new information is from weak ties. So I, when I learned that, I thought, oh, so we do do both. You're right, we do both. We're bridging and we're bonding. We're letting people that are already connected or connected deeply bond in this time. But we're also bridging and we're also making sure that people are using the market in different ways. And that is important that you look at social capital, not just by, you know, let's make sure the people that are here are connecting on lots of different levels, but that you're also thinking about ways that, you know, people that are not necessarily using markets, again, the growth of far Facebook for farmers markets has been an interesting one. It was immediate how many farmers markets got a Facebook page. And I think some other markets got Facebook page. I don't need that. That's not for me. I don't care about that stuff. And I think it's a good question. If there's not a right or wrong for any of this. But it bonds about bridging and bonding. Facebook will be a way that information can be sent between people that maybe don't come every week, but that may come once a month, or so on and so on. Or new people are found. Social networking is definitely a strong bridging tool, and a very strong weak type of tool. So that's the thing about social capital. How we measure that is very important, too. Um, how you engineer and how you add that capital in your market should be thought of constantly. This really is the core of it. You know, when a crisis happens, uh, whether internally or externally to your market, and the market uh, knows how to solve it, that's because you have trust and social capital in your market. Um, we've all gone through this. And of course, me and New Orleans having gone through a number of disasters now, recently, 
we saw how that played out in our own community. We had, of course, prices like everybody else and gone to our farmers and shoppers and said, here's what we have to do. And how many of them said, okay, we trust you. So of course, that's another piece of the trust is between market operator and farmer, market, market operator and shopper, market operator and neighbor. And that's another piece of how we have to do it. Uh, so I think social capital is something, you know, we really need to think a lot about. Intellectual capital, I, I would say that probably markets think about this a, a good amount of their time, but I think we get a little, you know, we go kind of for the obvious. You know, we say, well, we really said we give out this many recipe cards, that's information sharing, and that's true. But there's so many ways that this is happening. There's so many different ways. This picture actually is of uh, a chef in New Orleans who, uh, uh, most, actually, mostly spends her time on the road with bands like Dave Matthews as their chef. But she's also a caterer, and she's a great, great, great person, a great friend to the market. And she always brings things that she's growing or finding and sharing. So this is the Buddha hand, citrus type thing that she grows, and she brought to market, and she showed it to chefs, and she showed it to shoppers, and she showed it to farmers. And there were people in the audience who said, oh, I have that in my backyard. I wonder what that thing was. And she's like, very, it's a very scary looking thing. And she's like, oh, yes, here's what you do with it. Here's what I do with it. Here's how I use it. You know, I mean, the crowd around her, as she walked around with it, and she just brought it. She, again, you see this all the time. She brought it just to share it with somebody. But that's an extraordinary, I mean, how, you know, you go to the grocery store, you ever bring anything to the grocery store to show people? <laughs> yeah, try. They don't like no, yeah, you know, you, you, there are places where this sort of information yeah, the sharing is really, uh, uh, you know, honored, and the farmers market is certainly one of those places. But you have to, you can't rely that it's just happening. You have to make it happen more. You've got to find new ways to make it happen, and you've got to find ways to measure it. You know, it could just very well be that I just can count the many times Ann Churchill comes to market. It. And seeing what she's sharing. I mean, she just came to me, I just wrote a piece about her. She came to me, I saw her in, in January at the market, she's on off tour for a while. And she said, uh, you know, I'm going to be home for a couple months and um, got some time. You know, so let me know what I can do. You know, I love, I love people like that. And she's really like, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, she'll go to wig clinics with us and do, you know, demonstrations, she'll do our, you know, our market, our market board catering if we're doing a retreat for, you know, pennies on the dollar. You know, there's so many ways that someone like this is actually embedding herself in your community. Uh, ways, and the ways that she's sharing information back and forth and gaining information. Chefs are a great example of this on both levels. You know, er, in the early days, people would always write to us and say, how do you get chefs to work to, have to you know, be part of your community. And we said, what do you, what do you mean? We saw them at the market, we recognized them, we walked up to them and said, hey, are you, are you blah, blah, blah? Aren't you Susan Spicer? Uh, of course. And we said, great, here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to come more often, and if you could, wear your chef's jacket, because of course in New Orleans, chefs are really rock stars. And, and so when people see them shopping, you'll be amazed watching how home shoppers actually are following them around, asking them questions and vice versa. So we encouraged that. We said, can you, you know, stick around a little longer, come on our board. We made sure they were part of the decision making. Many times, as a matter of fact, we would say to a chef, take them aside and say, you know, I noticed you have a good relationship with that farmer. You know, we'd like them to do, they did this one, one year of this one product that was so great. Wasn't that great? It was great. But they don't seem to want to grow it again. Can you talk to them? Can you find out if you can get them to do more products? And we found that the chefs, were an incredibly good way to work with the farmers to increase their production. They continue to do it, and of course, in the city of New Orleans with over 2,000 uh, restaurants, we have a lot of chefs, some of them, and there are always, always you know, new ones coming, and we don't always recognize them, but we try to make sure that we use them in this way, intellectual capital way. It's one of our main uh, you know, tools of getting information shares through these chefs and use them as many more ways as we can. And you know, as long as we don't ask them to come too early on Saturday morning, um, they're actually pretty good at that. <coughs>